Side quests. Who doesn't love a good video game side quest? I know I do. They're often viewed as amusing distractions from the main storyline, but other times they'll have such a profound impact on the player that they'll end up causing more of an impression than the main campaign itself. <coughs> But sometimes, even the most seemingly innocuous side quest can evolve into a frenetic and downright hectic series of events. Take for example, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. When casually trying to save the world from a sentient and foreboding moon, you might stumble across Romani Ranch, a seemingly tranquil and convivial section of Termina. Doesn't sound like they're in the most dire of straits, right? Well, wrong. Due to the coveted milk produced at the ranch, it has become a target of numerous strings of misfortune, and it's up to Link to almost single-handedly save the ranch from collapse. To start, you have to find a way to destroy a massive boulder that prevents you from accessing the ranch on the first day, and if you do manage to find a solution, you'll spend the first day guarding the ranch's cattle from extraterrestrial ghosts. Yes, you heard me correctly. I didn't stutter. But then, when all seems fine and dandy, you'll have to assist Romani in a milk delivery that starts off innocently enough, but then subsequently leads to the envious Gorman brothers attempting to sabotage the delivery by barricading the trails and trying to break the bottles on horseback. All of this, and it all started by just checking out a seemingly peaceful ranch. This is what I'm talking about today. Side quests that begin in a relatively simple or innocent fashion, only to culminate in the complete opposite direction. So get some food, a drink, your favorite weapon, a friend or two, whatever else you can find, this one's gonna be a doozy. Enjoy! Young man, my dog ran away and I have not seen him in a few days. Please help me by asking people if they've seen my dog. There's so for all of the younger audience members watching this video, long before the ambitious, narratively driven campaigns of the modern Mortal Kombat games, the closest thing that you had to a story mode was Conquest Mode. What began as a series of glorified combo trials for characters quickly evolved into a surprisingly vast and expansive adventure, starring series newcomer Shujinko as he embarks on a journey to become one of the most proficient martial artists in the Mortal Kombat universe. Yes, the same Shujinko who turned his passion for kill Bill into an incentive to get on his good side. If he can do that to a heart, then imagine what would happen if he checked your prostate. And you know what? Despite the laughably horrendous voice acting, Great job! You are getting good at this. And the needlessly prolonged tutorial section, I actually prefer conquest mode to the standard story mode provided in the modern entries. There's just such a nostalgic early 2000s charm to it that captivates me. And if you bestow me with a game that allows me to ruthlessly attack the elderly with little to no consequences, then you bet your sweet ass I'm gonna enjoy my time playing it. <laughs> Now, in conquest mode, you can actually partake in a series of brief side quests and uncover hidden areas throughout the shockingly extensive map. In the early hours of conquest mode, you can find this woman in a quaint little house in the village. She's in a bit of a rough predicament, as her beloved dog Nico has gone missing, and it's up to you to uncover his whereabouts. Personally, though, I think this lady could have gone through a bit of extra effort if she was missing her dog so badly. I spent a good three and a half hours perusing through town, and there wasn't a single goddamn missing dog poster in sight. Some people don't deserve dogs, and they sure as hell shouldn't procreate either. After asking the local inhabitants about Nico's possible location, you'll find one villager in particular who unveils a startling confession. He found Nico, but he erroneously assumed that he was a stray, and took him to the local butcher, and, well, your mind can probably fill in the blanks. No leash, no collar, no sense of urgency in regards to finding her dog. If I found out that she left Nico malnourished while he was still alive, she'll be one step closer to making her debut TV appearance on a Netflix documentary alongside this halfwit. He'll offer you some of the last remains of Nico so you can give them to this woman as some sort of morbid condolence gift. But what's even more twisted is the woman's reaction to the whole ordeal. Gift the woman the dog meat and she'll understandably be left mortified. But then all sorrow goes right out the goddamn window because just a couple of seconds later, she says this. Oh well, I guess it is not a total loss. Will you join me later for some Nico stew? Well, they don't have dog pounds fit for humans, but I can think of a good alternative. Yeah, in just mere seconds, this woman decides to take life's lemons and make some lemonade. Or, in this case, a canine stew. I'm not actually sure if you can come back later to take her up on her offer, but the fact that she does in the first place is two parts disturbing and two parts darkly hilarious. But wait, it doesn't end there, because while researching this particular side quest, I found out it actually plays somewhat of a role in Deception's speedrunning scene. Because there's an entire run category called Dog Percent. That revolves around booting up Conquest Mode, hightailing it to the side mission, and completing it as fast as possible. No, I'm not joking. And for those curious, the current world record holder is No Novice Luke, with a time of 5 minutes and 10 seconds, or 4 minutes and 31 seconds if you cut the loading screens. At least Nico's death was honorable, albeit a bit gruesome. 
Did, uh, did you lose a tiger? Yeah, you found one? No, I found your caravan down the way. Margaret said you might need a hand. Oh. In the days of the Wild West, you'd be pretty hard-pressed to find someone who wasn't at least a little bit on the unorthodox side of things. Thankfully, the Red Dead series is chock full of zany and eccentric characters that you'll meet either during the events of the story or while exploring the world on your own volition. The first Red Dead Redemption has more than a few that I could pull from. Take, for example, this guy who's partaking in a little animal husbandry. In normal circumstances, this isn't at all what you think it means, but in this case, the title is kind of self-explanatory. But I think Red Dead Redemption 2 exhibits one of my personal favorite examples, and it all begins with the side mission, he's British of course. This is Margaret. He's an animal wrangler and a cross-dresser, but he's mostly a con artist. You'll see what I mean a little later. Margaret has misplaced his three exotic animals, a zebra, a tiger, and a lion. If there was a bear instead of a zebra and the order was reversed, this game would have received a sly Wizard of Oz reference, and consequently, a lawsuit from MGM on Rockstar's doorstep. It's now up to you to find the three missing animals, and while the task at hand might not be the most conventional, this mission certainly subverts your expectations in more ways than one. Let me explain. First, you gotta search for the zebra, and after some sleuthing, you'll discover that Margaret's zebra is nothing more than a donkey with some crudely drawn paint made to resemble stripes. You can choose to either lead it back to Margaret with a rope, or do what I did and unashamedly mount and ride it back to its owner. However, no amount of pride is gonna prevent the local civilians from mocking your noble steed. Return the donkey, and you'll now be tasked with finding Margaret's assistant, Sally, who will aid you in finding the tiger. Meet up with Sally, and she'll inform you that she got a dog, strapped a wig on it so that it could resemble a lion, and sent it on its merry little way to find the tiger. If she put that much faith in her dog, then surely this so-called tiger is probably nothing more than a large house cat. <sighs> I found your dog! I'm gonna guess it was a Maine Coon. And as it turns out, this isn't just an ordinary house cat. But it also isn't a tiger either. It's actually a cougar doused in bright orange paint with black stripes painted across its body. You'll have to use the remains of the dog to lure the cougar into its cage, and now you just have one more animal left to recapture, the lion. Head on over to Emerald Ranch and you'll see two clearly perturbed ranchers attempting to hold down a barn door, claiming that they witnessed a terrifying creature wreak havoc. Now these guys aren't exactly the sharpest nail in the toolbox, because due to the aforementioned event with the cougar, I I'd assume that they were cowering in fear over nothing more than a dog. And John over here agrees with me. That's a dog in there. A dog? Now, if you'll excuse me. They reluctantly open the door for you, and after a brief investigation, all hell breaks loose. And after hearing the calamity ensue, you rush outside and find out that this isn't your run-of-the-mill situation. Look what you've done! Look what you've done! Son of a bitch. I'm gonna go with a Great Dane for this one. After seeing a concerning number of freshly slaughtered ranchers and animals, you'll investigate the tracks and realize that this isn't an ordinary dog. In fact, it's not a dog at all. It's a fucking lion, and it's ready to add another tally to its killing streak. Two more and it'll earn the missile strike. This is a classic bait-and-switch side mission that genuinely caught me off guard my first time around, which is part of what made it such a downright fantastic side quest for me. Now, you've gotta put the lion down before it kills you, and I'll tell you right now, I actually died quite a fair bit in this situation, because John wouldn't stop reloading his gun at the beginning of the encounter. At first, I thought that this was some sort of obscure glitch that just wasn't patched out of the game, but as it turns out, you're constrained into only using standard ammunition for this event, and if you have any other type of ammo, John will immediately reload his gun to switch to the default ammo type. I restarted the mission, swapped over to my standard bullets, and proceeded to waste all nine of the cat's lives. After slaying the beast, the nearby inhabitants will celebrate, and you can claim yourself a gruesome trophy as a reward, which you can then take to a fence and craft the lion's paw trinket, which increases your gained XP stamina by 10%. Nice! Now it's time to talk to Margaret and get some things sorted out. Head back to Margaret and John will give him the peace of his mind for regretting to inform him that well, it was a real wild animal this time. And as a reward, Margaret bestows John with an emerald worth an absolute fortune. And given how reluctant Margaret was when it came to handing it over, I'm excited to see the fruits of my labor finally pay off. Why am I not surprised? Looking for work? Yeah, when can I start? Well, aren't you an ego beaver? When it comes to memorable video game side quests, Bethesda's vast library of games will often spring to mind. You can say what you will about these guys, their games are damn near unplayable on launch, their ambitions are a bit too lofty for their own good, and they've been recycling the same engine since 2003. For clarity, the creation engine is essentially just a modified extension of the Gamebryo engine. But damn it, these guys know how to make a good side quest. I was originally considering Come Fly With Me from Fallout New Vegas for this spot, which evolves from gathering info from Manny about your attacker's whereabouts to clear 
clearing out a Repcon test facility full of Nightkin to aid a brotherhood of ghouls in their quest for journeying into the great beyond. If you were like me though, and you realized that they were gonna leave behind one of their key players and never return, then sabotage was the only true outcome. You can expect how that went. However, this side mission is so frequently discussed online that I feel like I would effectively be rehashing material already explained by other people. Instead, I'm talking about one of my personal favorite side missions in the series, The Big Dig from Fallout 4. In Fallout 4, you might stumble across Good Neighbor, a town about as warm and welcoming as an ominous shack with the pleasant sound of a revved up chainsaw emanating from it. However, when you first mosey on into the town entrance, you're almost immediately robbed by this lovely individual, which then results in him getting his comeuppance courtesy of this absolute fucking G, Hancock. He's also the mayor, by the way. However, continuing to explore and investigate Good Neighbor will eventually lead you to the back streets of the town, where you'll find Bobby No-Nose who offers you some work. She doesn't give you much in terms of details, but if you agree, she'll give you 50 caps and instruct you to follow her. Given my rather promiscuous attire, I gotta ask, what kind of work is she expecting from me? Head inside and she'll tell you to assist the other two guys who have already dug out a tunnel leading to a lower underground level. You'll see two miners quickly hightailing it to the exit. And after sticking around, you realize that this particular area is packed to the brim with mire lurks. Clear them out and, well damn, I guess that's it. Wrong. It's far from over, and if you want to find out the juicy details of Bobby's plan, you're gonna have to stick it out with her for a while. That room was filled with mire lurks. Oh, shit. Bobby asks you to reconvene with her in Diamond City, where she'll finally give you some insight as to what she's been scheming. You see, Bobby has conjured up the idea of breaking into the Diamond City strong room. How, you may ask? Well, as it turns out, she's managed to locate an underground route that leads directly underneath the strong room. With a little bit of help and some perseverance, Bobby's plan sounds elaborate, methodically conceived, and kinda dangerous. But that's part of the fun, isn't it? Slight caveat, though, because she's missing an integral member of the team. And given that this is Bobby No-Nos we're talking about, a master delegator without any of the authority, she's gonna make you do the dirty work. Her associate, Mel, is locked away in Diamond City security, and you're gonna have to find a way to bust him out. You can either tackle the objective in a more, shall I say, conventional manner, or depending on your character's stats, you can actually sweet talk the guards into setting him free. Regardless of your choice, Mel is now a free man, but the rational and logical half of his brain was clearly negatively impacted because he almost immediately comes running right back to Bobby like an overly devoted and loyal puppy. Now, you're able to finally conduct the plan, and Mel has brought brought along his robot assistant, who specializes in using sonic resonance to cause soft walls to crumble down. However, this isn't your run-of-the-mill underground journey, because you'll have to face an onslaught of feral ghouls, mire lurks, and potentially a mire lurk king boss fight if you end up wandering down the wrong path. Along the way, Mel will begin to grow a little bit skeptical and suspicious of the route, because he thinks that we're heading too far south. To that I say, shut the fuck up, Mel, I promise you, if we were further south, we'd be third cousins and probably hitched by next week. <laughs> After finally making it to the surface, you begin to snoop around the vicinity, only to realize that it's not the Diamond City strong room, but instead a strong room owned by Hancock, the mayor of Good Neighbor. You know, the same guy who turned this guy over here into a human filet? Yeah, that Hancock. God damn it, Bobby, no knows I was gonna buy you scented candles for Christmas, why'd you have to backstab me? You're now stuck with the tough choice of siding with Bobby and killing the mayor's henchmen, or killing Bobby for deceiving you. You can also convince Bobby to stand down, but look, do you really think that's the choice I wanted to make? After killing Bobby, you're bestowed with two extremely nifty rewards. Fahrenheit, the leader of the henchmen, will gift you with the Ashmaker, a minigun capable of blasting flaming rounds. And after chatting with Hancock about the ordeal, he doesn't harbor any ill will towards you and thanks you for killing Bobby. And as the cherry on top, he'll become your companion in the process. And look, if you ask me, I'll take a gut stabber over a backstabber any day of the week. It's more effective anyway. Okay, so I want to preface this entry by talking about a post that I uploaded days before this video's release. I asked my audience to give me some suggestions for an entry that pertains to this video, and I was given a vast array of answers. However, I noticed a recurring trend. There were a shockingly high number of comments suggesting that I cover a side quest from a Yakuza title. Now, I wasn't aware of this prior to making this video, but the Yakuza series is absolutely stacked with seemingly simplistic side quests that often evolve into downright absurd and hilarious escapades. That being said, I didn't know which one to pick, but after scrolling a bit more, I stumbled across an absolute goldmine. Suggested by Subway to Venus 3237, this is Be My Boyfriend from Yakuza 0. やってる
Yakuza 0 is often regarded as the best game in the Yakuza series, which is kind of interesting to me because it's a prequel to the events that take place in the mainline series of games. That being said, with its 80s era setting, ungodly large quantity of things to do, and a pretty kick-ass combat system, I quickly understood the praise that this game garnered. Of course, it's no slouch when it comes to the side quest department, and I figured that the Be My Boyfriend side quest was a damn near perfect fit for this video, even if it's one of the more wholesome examples on the list, which is also something that was pointed out by Subway to Venus 3237. Once again, thank you for the suggestion. When playing as Goro Majima, you'll come across a woman named Koko-chan, who is seemingly hellbent on becoming your girlfriend. Now this right here is the part where the average Reddit moderator gets a little bit too excited. Continue to chat with her, and as it turns out, she doesn't actually want to be your girlfriend, she just wants you to pretend to date her so that she can impress her father, who's going to be visiting town really soon. See, her father was so persistent in finding a boyfriend for her, that he attempted to put her in an arranged marriage with a few hand-picked suitors. And after being agitated, she told him to ease off the gas, so to speak, because she already has a boyfriend. And rather humorously, she described her fabricated boyfriend as having an eye patch, a ponytail, and a gritty yet dangerous demeanor, which if you couldn't tell, describes Majima over here to a T. In other words, she needs you to fake being her boyfriend or else, no pressure by the way, her dad will force her into an arranged marriage. Majima begrudgingly agrees, but you soon find out that this isn't as simple as the classic a nice to meet you sir handshake and a couple of dad jokes. No, 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 she's already arranged a dinner with you, her, and her dad, and you have to be able to impress the guy, which according to her is not such a rudimentary task, because he tends to blow his lid when things don't go his way. In order to circumvent this, she'll actually give you a detailed list of things to say to him when he tries to pry a little information out of you. She'll tell you that you're supposed to be a dentist, that you like going out on drives and watching movies, and that you love the omelet rice that she makes. Now, whenever the dad does eventually show up, he'll ask you the traditional assortment of questions, but often they'll have a slight twist that makes things a little bit more difficult. For example, instead of simply asking what you do in your free time, he'll instead ask how you and Koko-chan met. Despite the slight internal panic that poor Majima goes through when asked these questions, it's actually nothing more than a simple series of mind games. Because if you just answer the questions with the options that Koko-chan provided you with, then Majima will be able to acclimate to the situation and think up a fairly convincing answer right on the spot. What's kind of hilarious about this is that you can answer the questions however you like and still be able to complete the mission, but the rewards earned at the end will be of considerably lower quality. Complete the mission with all of the correct answers and you'll earn the sprite belt, which doubles weapon durability. However, it doesn't quite end there because after the date is finished, Koko-chan's father will reveal to you that he saw right through the ruse and knew that you weren't actually his daughter's boyfriend. However, he's so impressed with your dedication to faking it that he doesn't take any offense to it. In fact, he's so impressed with Majima in general that he asks him to actually become his daughter's boyfriend because he views him as the ideal man. Just wait till he finds out what Majima does for a living. However, it goes even beyond that because he's so enamored by Majima that he proudly exclaims that if Koko-chan doesn't take you, then he will. Oh my god. In other words, Majima was able to convert this seemingly hard to impress and overbearing father into one that now wants a bite of Majima's cookie, if you know what I mean. That is quite possibly one of the most fucking hilarious ends to a quest that I've ever seen, and after finding out how farcical and comparatively lighthearted this side quest was, I knew I just had to include it. Thank you once again for the suggestion. You want me to text you photos of your own wife? <laughs> I'll pay, buddy. I've got a black card. <laughs> I'm afraid I only take care. All right, so you probably would have guessed that a Grand Theft Auto game was gonna make this list, but you probably didn't expect this particular entry from my favorite game in the series, Grand Theft Auto 4. In Grand Theft Auto 4, when you're not taking advantage of your cousin's kindness or kicking his ass in bowling, you're probably just cruising through the streets of Liberty City and discovering all that it has to offer. You'll come across your fair share of individuals who have at least a couple of screws loose, the most notable being Jeff, referred to in-game as Cuckold Jeff, Jesus Christ. Even in 2008, they knew what was up. Jeff is paranoid to a downright unhealthy degree about his wife's faithfulness to him, or in this case, lack thereof. He's under the assumption that his wife is a serial cheater, and he's quite outspoken in his less than savory feelings about the matter. Bitch! Bitch! It's kind of fitting that this guy's asking for help from an ex-soldier turned criminal who robs a bank and then goes bowling with his earnings that same afternoon. You're a fucking G, Nico Bellic. Never change. Jeff asks you to do a little reconnaissance by taking some compromising pictures of his wife engaging in the affair. However, Jeff's fearful ramblings were nothing more than paranoia, because as it turns out, his wife, Shirley, was never actually having an affair with him. Shirley had nothing more than a strictly platonic relationship with the unnamed gentleman, and in fact, the only reason she decided
decided to meet up with the guy in the first place was for emotional support due to Jeff's concerningly high lack of faith and trust in her. That being said, you can kill these two in the cafe if you want to, but if you want to continue this series of missions, you'll have to leave the pair unscathed. After sending the pictures, Nico informs Jeff that he has nothing to worry about and that he should probably make a better effort to trust her. And, well, that's it, right? Well, after 10 in-game days, you'll get a cryptic and rather alarming phone call from Jeff, where he asks you to meet him in an underground parking lot, where he reveals that his wife accidentally stabbed herself 50 times with a kitchen knife, which is just a fancy and Boeing-approved way of saying that he murdered her in grisly fashion. After this ordeal, he threw her body in the trunk of the car, and, well, here we are. He then pays you $5,000 to dispose of the evidence, which leads to Nico driving the car into a nearby river. And you would think that after all of that, the quest line would conclude in that very moment, right? Wrong. Absolutely not. Because after some time, you'll find Jeff in Little Italy, who at this point has abandoned any shred of sanity that he had left. Apparently, he's remarried, and as you'd imagine, he's under the suspicion that his new wife is cheating on him. In fact, the reason he's in Little Italy to begin with is because he followed his wife to a restaurant where she decided to have a drink with her ex. Whether she's actually having an affair or not, I don't know. But Jeff is more than convinced, and asks Nico to put her down, and thankfully he refuses. Jeff then decides enough of enough and dashes out to the street to commit the act himself, before aptly colliding with a speeding car and dying on the spot. And just to add a little bit of dark humor to the end of the mission, the driver gets out, attempts to call 911 to report the death, but after he gets put on hold, he decides that it's not worth reporting and then drives off. There's a part of me that wants to feel bad for this guy, I mean, really, I do. Especially given that he briefly mentions his mom leaving his dad when he was younger, which could have been the catalyst for his chronic paranoia, but I mean, eh, it's kinda warranted. Tell me what it is you want from me. Well, this one time Rachel is right. We can't stay here. Come with us. You'll find out all you need to know on the way. Got to object strongly. Noted. And for the last entry, we're looking at the absolute pinnacle of examples when it comes to side quests that go from 0 to 100 in the blink of an eye. Sinner Man from Cyberpunk 2077. So the side quests of Cyberpunk 2077 often revolve around V getting a call, a request to get his hands dirty with some crime-related activities, and then an electronic payment wired straight to his account. Obviously, there's a bit more nuance and complexity to it than that, but you get what I mean. That being said, there are more than a few side missions that have their fair share of twists and turns, with one of the greatest examples coming in the form of Sinner Man. After the main story mission, Life During Wartime, Wakako Wakata tasks you with somewhat of a peculiar request. She won't reveal the explicit details, but she'll inform you that the customer, Bill Jablonski, wants you to meet up with him and conduct the gig in front of his very eyes. A little specific, but I'll admit, at first glance, this just seems like your run-of-the-mill assassination mission. You'll link up with Jablonski, and without any additional details or a second to lose, he gives you the keys to the driver's seat, waits for the target to show up, and when said target does show up, he tells you to floor it like there's no tomorrow. After beginning your chase, Jablonski will give you a bit of insight as to what's going on. The target that we're chasing is Joshua Stevenson, a man who, years prior, had murdered Jablonski's wife and was sent to death row. However, a higher-up was able to bail Stevenson out of his jail term, preventing him from being executed. This, understandably, upsets Jablonski, so he's ready to take some gratifying revenge on the guy and have a sense of closure. Keep up with the car, and Jablonski will suddenly tell you to pump the brakes, and if you oblige, he'll dash out of the car without even a modicum of caution, and get capped in the process by Officer Vasquez. After this, things began to turn really fucking bizarre, to put it bluntly, as Joshua, Vasquez, and a woman named Rachel will begin to argue about the current situation, stating that they need to leave the area. However, in a peculiar twist, Joshua asks you to tag along for the ride. Now, you don't actually have to get in the car, as you can simply refuse his offer and be on with your day. However, if you do decide to go with the group, you are in for one hell of a twisted and surprisingly thought-provoking ride. See, Joshua is actually quite remorseful for his depraved actions of the past, as he's murdered quite a few people in cold blood. However, after learning about Christianity, Joshua essentially altered his outlook on life, and now spends his days repenting for his sins. He wants to make amends with those that he's wronged in the past, and driving with him will immediately lead to a follow-up mission, There is a Light That Never Goes Out. Now, mind you, you still don't get the full picture as to what's going on. Why is there an officer assisting Joshua in his quest for forgiveness? Who is this woman? Why is she here? Why does she resemble the bastard child of Pink and 2016 Ghostbusters Kate McKinnon? Fuck if I know. 
know. But more on that later because this next part of the side mission chain begins with Joshua meeting up with a woman named Zalika El Amar, I think that's how you say it, who invites the both of you into her house. It's revealed that Joshua murdered this woman's brother, but instead of holding a grudge against him, she chose to write to him while he was in prison and forgave him, citing her Christian faith as the reason for doing so. This is what ultimately converted Joshua to Christianity and essentially kickstarted his new outlook on life. Joshua then finally fills you in on the situation. See, Rachel over here actually works for a brain dance studio. If you've never played Cyberpunk, it's essentially a technology that allows you to record and replay an experience that a person goes through, while also allowing you to feel the very sensations and emotions that they underwent in that very moment. What event does this particular brain dance studio want to record, and what does it have to do with Joshua? Simple, they want to record his crucifixion, because they believe that it will make for a good brain dance. It's not like Joshua's unaware of this either, because he's the one that wanted to make it in the first place, as he believes that his crucifixion will inspire others to convert to Christianity. Yeah, that, that came out of fucking nowhere, good god. After this, Zulika's mother will walk in, and unlike her daughter, she's not exactly the forgiving type. Understandably so, might I add. After she orders you to leave, you and the crew drive off and decide to get a bite to eat. But then Rachel stops you in your tracks and attempts to convince you to walk away from the situation by paying you double what you were originally going to receive in the first place. You can actually take the bribe and end the quest line here, but you saw the title of the video. I don't cave in that easily. I want to see this guy nailed to a cross, damn it. You chat with the crew for a bit, they leave, Johnny starts getting all philosophical with thoughts about religion and divine powers and whatnot, and after leaving the restaurant and waiting a few days, you'll get a call from Rachel and this is where shit hits the fan. Accepting the call from Rachel will lead to the final quest in the chain, they won't go when I go. She'll tell you that Joshua needs a little bit of a pep talk from you before undergoing his crucifixion, which you can refuse, believe it or not, resulting in the mission ending prematurely. However, if you choose to show up, oh boy, you're in for a doozy. Arrive at the building, meet up with Rachel, and she'll guide you to the dressing room, where Joshua is beginning to have some doubts and caution about the situation. He then asks for your input, and you can choose to be positive or negative, but depending on some of your dialogue choices from the earlier missions, there's a chance that he'll perform the crucifixion regardless. Rachel comes in, tells you that it's time for the big show, and before it begins, Joshua doesn't just request that you stay and view the crucifixion, oh no no no, he asks you to be the one who nails him to the cross, holy shit. For the more squeamish players, don't worry you can refuse to perform the act, and hell, you can even leave without having to watch the gruesome act play out. Bad news for those same squeamish players, though, because I'll give you three guesses as to the one I chose. Stop it. Get some help. Yeah, it's really disturbing, to be frank with you. And then, at the very end of the quest, all you're left with is the haunting sight of Joshua pinned to a cross as he slowly closes his eyes and accepts his fate. It's such an unnerving yet undeniably riveting side quest that serves as one of Cyberpunk 2077's finest. And let me remind you, this all started from a guy wanting to enact revenge on his wife's killer. This is quite a lot to take in, so I think I'm gonna take a break from Cyberpunk and you know, decompress a little bit. You know, a little ocarina of time wouldn't hurt. And would you look at that? I found a wishing well. I've always wanted to know what's at the bottom of one of these. <laughs> 